Okay. Thanks. Uh, so dimensional analysis in graded algebras. Uh, this is a work in progress and joint work with Nicola Botta at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research and uh, Guillermo de Silva, who is a student in Brazil, actually coming to Chalmers as a PhD student as soon as he's got the sort of admin permits, whatever, from, from the immigration office or something like that. He's not coming to work with me. He's coming to work with Wolfgang Arendt, who's doing other things with the um well what is it it's it's some blockchain something something <laughs> we'll see where it ends up uh so uh, this is um this slide basically is for for the pdfs to be online later so that's the abstract i sent in and so on i just want to mention also that this i was looking for agda talks agda related talks and i think at least from my time in the group the first one was at the uh, in 2007 in Kyoto when I gave an Agra tutorial um, was was fun and then uh, it seems to be mentioned in, in a number of other physical meetings after that so uh, I will use a little bit of uh, Agda syntax and examples here so it might be seen as um, introducing some of, of that language I guess and the source code is online um, okay so into the actual topic uh, dimensional analysis, and there are a number of concepts that pop up here. So one is the sort of rather diffuse thing of physical quantities. So uh, I, I'll do this step by step, filling in more details as we go. But the, the, the general idea is that you've got some kind of uh, physical quantities and that you can assign dimensions to these. Sometimes it's called units. So uh, informally here, there's some kind of function from Q for quantities to D for dimensions. And uh, these are things like uh, length, speed, uh, force, and so on are measured. Uh, they're measured with respect to some, some system of units like the SI, the international system of units, but uh, any other system is could be fine as well. And there is um, there are a number of dimensions. Some of them are called base dimensions and then like length or so, and then you got area, which is a square of that and so on. And um, when working with dimensional analysis, which is then a, a tool for helping out and simplifying some equations and so on in, in the, then you often want to stay in a, as small a class as you can, which means that, for example, for geometry, you just have lengths. So the, the base dimension of length uh, is used. And then we, the class of these systems is called just L for length. And then kinematics, when things move around and have length, then that LT it has two dimensions, two base dimensions. And for mechanics, it's usually enough to have length, times, and masses. And then you can add like you know, currents or, or um, uh, light and then all, all kinds of stuff. And uh, but as as I mentioned, to make the most of it, uh, you usually want to stay in a small class as, as as you can. So you could go to the SI unit class of seven uh, base units, but uh, that would not necessarily help you. So it's good to have it parameterized over which units you actually want to work with. It's also the case. That's it. Yes. Um, can I ask a question? So sure. uh, do we have in, in geometry, for example, what do you do with angles? So angles are, are well, according to the system units, dimensions, so they, are, they don't have a dimension. So they're dimensionless. Um, so it, it's a, a, a rescaling of a ratio between lengths, I guess. Um, OK, right. Thanks. But sometimes you may want to keep these things different. Uh, but it's not about, for example, radians or degrees. That's that's a, that's a choice of units within a dimension. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's the choice of units within a dimension. So I was wondering whether that's a dimension or not. Hmm. Well, the, the, the dimension dimensionless is a dimension. I mean, or I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we will see the the details. But uh, yeah. So let's, let's move on. So in, in, informally, one, one talks about, say, that the acceleration is, is length over time squared, for example. But the, actually, if you look up the, the more formal books on, on this, they, they talk about the dimension function. So then I guess functional programming is a good setting here. 
So a uh, uh, lambda LTM to L over T squared, if you're in this three unit or it's three dimensional system would be the, the function here. And what is this function doing? This uh, basically monomial, it's describing how the measured value of in this case acceleration should change if we change the units of measurements. And to exemplify this, let's start with something easier. So my height of dimension length is measured to 1.78 if we have unit meters, but it's measured to another number, 178 in centimeters. And if we measure in, in the in number of, of uh, green apples, like, like the, I think the Smurfs are, are, are supposed to be three apple high or something like that. Um, then of course we get another number. So in general, if we make the unit of measurement L times smaller, we make the measured height L times bigger. And that means that the height, some abstract notion of height is actually invariant, but the measured value changes in the opposite direction of the measuring rod. And this is just like when we have like um, linear algebra and so on, we change the basis and, and then we change the, 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 the coordinates in the opposite direction of how we change the basis. If the basis vector becomes very small, then the number of units of this basis vector becomes very big. So you could say this, this is all about one dimensional vector spaces. Um, so the simplest linear scaling is, is then for, for when you have something of the base dimension, but if you have something like an area or an acceleration, then there are several, I mean, that there are pot, uh, powers of these base units. So we, the area scales as a square, the volume as a third power of the, of the base dimension and so on. And in general, these, these dimension functions express how if you change potentially all of these length measurements and time measurement and mass measurement units, how the actual value changes. So acceleration is multiplied by L, but divided by T squared and, and uh, force is then yeah, the, the relation at the bottom of the screen multiplied by M and so on. Um, there are nice parametricity results you can do here, which I will not talk about today, but there is a paper from like 20 years ago or so about parametricity. And, and um, I think they decided to call it UNIS there, but it's also about dimensional analysis. So, okay, physics. Um, if you have an equation like F equals mass times acceleration, then the dimensions of the left and right have to match. So that's one of the sort of requirements here. And, and that basically says also that addition and subtractions have to stay within one dimension because you could subtract the left and right and side from each other and so on. For multiplication though, we don't have to require matching dimensions and, and well, it, it, they never really do require it. So, so, and what's required instead is that dim is a homomorphism. So if you have the dimension of the multiplication, then you should be able to multiply the dimensions of the parts. So that's this dim of M times A is dim of M multiplied. And this is a star with a D subscript here. So that's a, we need then uh, a possibility of multiplying dividing dimensions and uh, some dimensionless value as well. So let's move towards uh, something which is actually, if, if we think about Oleg's presentation, this is a, um, well, what was it called? It's, an, it's a module or anyway, it's, it's an interface in the way that Agda would write it. So this is a record type. So it's not really an implementation yet. It's just the, the specification of the things we might want to, to capture what the dimension is. So dimension itself is a type we got dimension less as a value of the type. We got multiplication and division of dimensions. And then using these, we can also implement dimension to the power of an integer uh, returning a dimension. Well, we get what actually the actual laws expected later, but so far let's assume that we have a type for dimensions, a dimension less quantity in multiplication and division. And then using these, we can then build uh, a similar specification then of the quantities, and then we then make a type which is indexed by dimension. So here is some some noise at the top about Agda modules and opens and, and local variables and so on. But the record type here, the Q stuff thingy, contains the Q, 
which is then a parameterized type. So for each dimension, you got a type. And then the dimension function, which or the, the dim function, which from every Q of D for a certain dimension extracts the D. And then you got three operations here and three on the next slide. So you got for each, in each uh, quantity, quantity of each dimension, you got a zero, an addition, a scaling. So this is what I mentioned about uh, a linear algebra here, a vector space. So you got the one dimensional vector space for each D that has zero addition and scaling. And you also got multiplications. But when you, when you stay on this slide, everything is homogeneous in D. So zero addition and scaling does not change the D. They are within one sort of um, specific dimension. But when you get to the multiplicative aspects, then you're actually having one dimension for the left operand, another dimension for the right operand, and a third dimension potentially for the products of the two operands. So uh, the dimension index here tracks uh, the operations performed on the quantities. Um, so this, this was all sort of the specification level. I was just giving the types and signatures of these things. And now try, let's try to be a little more concrete and filling in for an, an example. So we can, if we stick to this LTM class, so the length, time, and mass class, um, stick to representing dimensions by a vector of three integers. And those three integers are basically the exponents of L, T, and M in the monomials that represent uh, how different values should scale. And you could also, as another way of describing it, say that this is the free abelian group or something like that uh, over three generators, L, T, and M. So the only thing you have to keep track of is how many times have you multiplied L by itself and T by itself and M by itself, because you can always reorder them. It's an abelian group somewhere in the bottom. Uh, so you only need to store the, the exponent, the, the integer exponent of L, of T, and of M in a vector. So this um, means then that, that multiplication of dimension you can just add the exponents. Division of dimensions, you can just subtract the exponents. The dimensionless quantity is just a three, uh, well, it's a zero vector in the three dimensional space here. L, T, and M are just three different base vectors. You, you just have to choose an order for where to, to represent them. So this is not the same as the vector space thing I was talking about earlier. This is just base vectors in the, in the space of dimensions and not in the space of quantities. Um, so this is a concrete implementation. We could also have implemented the syntax tree data type for dimensions with the plus constructor and the minus constructor and the, some, some uh, constants. And then we could have uh, compiled it or translated over to this vector type. But uh, let's, let's just stick to this to not have too many representations around. We already have both multiplication with and without the D subscripts and, and addition with or without the B subscript. So we, have, we shouldn't collect too many operations here. Okay, so then the, the actual Q record uh, is then actually a trivial record. So it's a record type with a parameter D. It's, it has a constructor val for building the value and a destructor or field uh, name val for destructing it. But it's Q of D is just a, an S, a scalar S. So we've assumed that there is a scalar type S somewhere. And then, well, extracting the dimension is just uh, returning the D, which is the index of this type. And then, well, getting the value out is the val uh, constructor. So you can you can extract the value, but you shouldn't then export this to, to um, the actual users because then you could do build these values in, a, in an unstructured way. You should actually keep it private. So then, as I mentioned earlier, Q of D for every D is a one dimensional vector space. So it's trivial to implement these operations. Zero, the quantity zero is just a value zero of the scalar type. Addition is just addition inside, and scaling is just the scalar multiplication 
of s and the inner value x here. So that's um, nothing strange, but it is also what is called a graded field. I haven't had any proofs here, but that's a structure that this will fulfill. So one is the value one, the multiplication. Now still with the same type as before, the quantity of a dimension one and dimension two have the make a quantity of the product of the dimensions and the actual values inside X and Y are just multiplied with a scalar multiplication. So here I do sort of a parallel multiplication on the on the type level and or the index level there and in the actual type. Um, so then um, with these operations, you can then uh, ask yourself, okay, what does a graded field mean? Is this a field or is it not a field? And if we have an underlying field S, we get a backer field for Q of di dimensionless, but actually not of QD for any other D. So why is that? Well, it's not closed under multiplication. So multiplication here in the simplest case, if we have a length and a length and we multiply them, we don't get a length, we get an area. We get a Q, so we, we end up in a different index. So if you multiply two length values, we don't get the length value. So, so it can't be a field directly in the sense that the, the operation, multiplication operation isn't really closed here. So you can recover that um, and get uh, operations on a sum type or a pair type of a dimension and a Q of that dimension, but then you lose the the thing we actually want to use the dimensional analysis for, the fact that you can only multiply, well, that you keep track of the dimensions, that different dimensions actually are um, tracked in the type. Anyway, you, you can always see it as a, as a family of fields. For each index, there is a field, and they interact through this uh, multiplication. Um, Patrick, uh, yes. are you looking at the chat? Uh, Lambert put some uh, comments. No, on. I didn't. Let's let's try to open the chat. Uh, sorry for that. Zoom has a way of making windows very big. Uh, so I should be able to open. Okay, there's been four messages in the chat. Okay. Um, an angle is dimensionless quantity consequences that torque has the same dimension as energy, although these are fundamentally different physical quantities that can be solved by giving angle the dimension, say A. Draw at is trigonometric functions like sine and cosine do not have dimension type one to one, but A to one. Yeah, so, so I, I should say that uh, there are a number of cases where you might want to uh, add dimensions to your system. For example, uh, sometimes in economics, you, you want to keep track of uh, goods and the prices and so on. And then you could sort of make up dimensions which are actually not from physics, but just sort of, and, and may not be a really true representation of how the world is modeled, but it's still useful for getting things to go right. And I, I think this is a little bit similar to that, but um, the, um, um, one has to be a little bit careful of adding your own dimensions because as soon as you add new dimensions, you also um, have to deal with that conversion between them. And, and this is a little bit related to the sine and cosine. I mean, you could say that sine and cosine have type angle to units, but you could also say that before you're applying sine and cosine, you have to convert this angle thing to something uh, non-dimensional. And uh, these conversion factors then get a little bit in the way, but uh, it's it's certainly possible to to add more dimensions than these. And it's not a, at least not known to me if there is a good story for why we have these uh, dimensions that we have and what more you can add without getting into trouble in in either physics or other things. I mean, I, I should mention maybe this is a bit too off topic, but that there is some kind of um, scaling symmetry underlying this whole thing, the physical uh, laws. And in physics, as you might know, there are lots of, of um, symmetries. And sometimes they, they have these symmetries and then suddenly they discover a new particle or something like that, or a new energy regime where there is some symmetry breaking operations that come in. 
And there might be, I suppose, symmetry breaking operations, even for those basic scaling symmetries as well. I mean, we don't really know. So um, there is a, there are interesting questions there in the fundamental physics side about what, which symmetries are, are could be, could be well modeled in different things here. So this is the the sort of um, scaling symmetries and uh, uh, of of the usual quantities that we're talking about. Anyway, uh, Patrick, you're you're, yes? you're 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 pondering about what it is that makes a valid system of dimensions and what doesn't mm -hmm. is isn't it exactly this grading structure you can introduce whatever you like you can say that us dollars is a is a dimension and everything's mm -hmm. measured all values all goods are measured in dollars or you could say that dollars and euros are different and they uh, and that would be another um yeah uh, dimensions Hmm. Yeah, and, and both both those assumptions would be would be useful because it's, uh, I mean, what 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 you assume when you have different units within a dimension is that there is a a, a fixed factor between them, right? And, and I guess euros and dollars, uh, yeah. uh, the, the the conversion rate there, you have to assume that you're in a fixed time step. Otherwise, that will be changing over time, which would be other right. Convenient. But then, I mean, if you if you if you wanted to take account of fluctuating exchange rates, then you just say euros and dollars are not commensurate, mm. incommensurate. Um, and and that too is a valid system of dimensions. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the algebraic and structure. And so the, is, the question, the question of. Limited. So, so the, the question of what what is and what isn't a sound system of dimensions is is just what does or does not make a graded field, isn't it? I thought this is quite nice. Well, I mean, that's on the algebraic side, yes, but you might want to see if physics agree. I mean, this this oh, came from discussion with, with physics. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, right, certainly. You, I, I think you're, you're limiting yourself if you only talk about physics. No, no, I, I just mean that um, already... With physics, it's an interesting question, and then of course, if you yeah. if you make up your own dimensions, then then uh, then this is just a nice way of capturing it, saying that this is a, as as long as you make a graded field, then you're fine. I'd say that the other way around. The physics is a very special one where you might have some tangible model that you can have whatever you want. Actually, I mean, as physics is concerned, that's actually more interesting. I mean, well, we. We know these, I mean, uh, familiar SI, right? But even, for example, in electromagnetics, then there is, a, I mean, uh, interesting things, right? Where, for example, uh, uh, ca capacity is, um, I mean, it has the same dimension as centimeters, right? Kind of strange dimensions. Uh, but uh, a lot of theoretical physics, it's done in dimensionless units where everything, I mean, there are no dimensions, so everything is dimensionless. So, well, I, I think uh, that most things in physics, then to, to get the, the, the mathematics to, to work out fine, you, you start by sort of defining your, your base units and then work with the dimensionless measurements of those units. But I mean, m most things do have a dimension at the, in the beginning and they do keep track well, of yeah, I mean, they implicitly I mean, or explicitly make sure that their equations are a dimensionless uh, or, or dimensionally correct, well dimensioned. In, in relation yes. to well typed. But my question is kind of, I mean, I know when you started in uh, uh, like theoretical physics where they, I mean, disregard all the dimensions, right? Well, they worked in dimensional C units, which you can always do by, I mean, I know, I mean, reducing everything in the, I mean, I know, well, uh, dividing by appropriate things, right? So you can have fundamental, for example, for length, you can have fundamental unit of length, Planck length, you divide by this, and then you get dimensions ratio. And you work only with dimensions, dimensions ratio, right? And for si same thing for velocity, you divide by C, and then you get, again, dimensions ratio. So, I mean, you reduce everything in dimensionless, and then, therefore, you kind of work in an untyped language, right? So it's interestingly, I mean, can you introduce, I mean, I know, what type can you introduce to this language to kind of, I mean, I don't know, make, I mean, I don't know, uh, to, I mean, I don't know, to keep you on track. So either dimensions is the can considered to be so a type or one can introduce finer types, so more coarser types. Well, finer types, I mean, I don't know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. 
uh, it's an interesting question of, of to what degree you can use these things. And, and definitely they're used more or less uh, automatically by people in physics. So that they usually don't think too much about it, but they usually keep their equations uh, dimensionally consistent. And then very, very often, as you say, they just divide everything by some sort of natural units for whatever that, that field is. If it's... Um, if it's very big things, it's divided by, by something uh, rather big. And if it's extremely small things, then they use like things like a Planck length and a, and yeah, different things. But let's let's move on a, a few more slides, and because it's actually uh, rather close um, to the end here, and we've used up more time perhaps already. Um, so no, just to just go ahead, we still have time. Yeah, we have plenty of time. Yeah, I just want to say that um, just to, to get all the concepts in place, we, we also talked about that the quantities here should be able to be measured. So, um, and then we measure a quantity with respect to a system of units. So here uh, I define a system of units as a vector of scalars. So one scalar for each of L, T and M. Um, and uh, for example, the, the SI system then would measure, measure things with, with meters, kilograms, and seconds, or, or the CGS system you measure in centimeters, grams, and seconds, and so on. And um, then we can interpret one of these syntactic dimensions, these vectors of exponents that I had introduced before as its dimension function, the thing we talked about in the beginning, the monomial that uh, computes the change in measured values. So if we do this, then this translation, the dim fun from a dimension and a system of units, it will basically zip with the power function, the system of units and the dimension. So the exponents, so the different values in SU are taken to the exponents in D. And then you just multiply uh, the resulting scalars then you get a translation. I mean, this this arg d is translated to a function from system of units to a scalar, and then then you can measure um, the quantity in a system of units. So you have a QD. So this is supposed to be the only place where you're allowed to look inside QD. So the val constructor here should not be exported, but measure should be exported if you want to get out of the QD. Otherwise, you should just use this one. So you. You multiply the value by the what the dimension function says that um, you should get. So val here got the, the scalar, dim got the index, uh, the dimension index, and dim fun takes that uh, dimension index and multiplies it by the actual units to, to convert the value. So um, then, then we sort of have the, the structure. We have a grotty graded field together with a measure function. And uh, just to, to, to exemplify, if we have these, then we end some, some uh, values, we can measure the, my height in the CGS system. And then, well, not surprisingly, it will be 178. Um, if we define the dimension of acceleration as L divided by T squared, the syntax here is a little bit uh, well, I, I got lots of indices on different operations because we got different multiplications and divisions and so on. Then if I got an actual value of an acceleration in the SI units, and then I want to look at it um, at some other, um, uh, well, actually here, I didn't look at the acceleration. I only looked at the force that we get from my mass with the current uh, gravity uh, then we can measure that, uh, and that will be instead of 66, it will be 76,000 grams. And instead of 909.82, it will be 982 centimeters per square second, and so on. So, this is just a sort of a make sure to check that these things are not. Uh, well, work out as, as we would expect. Now, I, I should mention actually in the same way as, as Fritz's question about r r rings and fields and so on, I, I do compute here with doubles and doubles do not form a field in the computer, but uh, that's the, the same kind of assumption here that we ignore rounding errors currently. Okay, so when we have these quantities in place, I will not formulate the pi theorem, but the pi theorem 
is uh, basically from over a hundred years ago, uh, the sort of the core of dimensional analysis. It's it's saying how you should um, handle equations where you have different dimensions in and, and, and how to reduce the dimensionality or the, or the problem, you could say. So let's let's take one concrete example of that. So this is a bit of an interesting example. So you wake up uh, perhaps with a hangover in the closed room. Uh, there is no, no way of getting out of it. You don't know where you are and you feel very heavy. It may be the result of the headache or of, of the hangover, or it may be the result of gravity actually being higher here, or maybe you're in an elevator accelerating upwards or, or something like that. So you want to figure out, I, am, I, am I just dreaming or, or is the gravity actually higher than usual here? So fortunately, you wake up in this room, you've got a pendulum. There is a point mass hanging from a piece of string and you can measure the time of a period of this one. So you experiment a bit, you hang it out in different angles and, and, and measure the time. And I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a number of uh, parameters in here, M, X, T, and theta, and, and then the potential gravity. And it's a bit difficult if it's, you have all these things in general, it would be difficult to compute the acceleration, but it's, it's actually dimensional analysis can be of help here. Um, so if you, if you define it as, okay, let's let's try to compute the gravity, let's compute the, the acceleration um, g from the quantity you measure from the mass the, of the hanging from this uh, piece of string, the length of the string, the time it takes for a period, and the dimensionless angle theta that you started the, the, the thing from, and you want to compute an acceleration. So the, the question here is what kind of expressions could add up here? Could you simplify this a bit? And what dimension analysis tells is that these kinds of functions can be simplified. They can be factored. So first you, you pick as many numbers, quantities as you can of independent dimensions. And in this case, you've got M, X, and T. They, the, those three have mass, length, and time as dimensions, and they are linearly independent in this type of um, dimensions that I had before. Uh, make the remaining quantities dimensionless. So there's not much left here. For example, theta is already dimensionless and the gravity G can now be rescaled to an acceleration, which is um, by, by multiplying it by t the, the time measurement squared and dividing it by X, we get a dimensionless acceleration. So the, the problem of computing G is sort of reduced to computing A, the dimensionless A. And uh, the thing is that this acceleration computation, the A in terms of the other values uh, is now only a function of the angle theta. So acceleration from theta to well, it measures from, from theta. And the whole computation of the real uh, gravitational constant from these four parameters is actually a monomial times the acceleration in terms of theta. And if you look at the types, I, I uh, didn't do this in Emacs mode here, but if you, if you start with a question mark for the monomial in Agda mode, there is actually very little choice for filling in this monomial. So this way of converting. So as this is dimensionless, the theta, the monomial must make sure the dimension of acceleration comes in here. So it has to do the opposite of this transformation. It has to multiply by X and it has to divide by time squared. And that is, I mean, of course you, you could first multiply by time and then divide by time to the power of three. And you could do this sort of unnecessary operations, but otherwise there is actually no, no choice left here. The type really dictates the value of this monomial. Um, and, and what does this say? Well, it means that if you want to, for example, infer what the gravity is from these measurements, then instead of having to figure out a four value function, you actually end up with only having to figure out this one value function of acceleration. And if you do a few experiments, you might notice that, that uh, this is basically a constant, this acceleration. Uh, for small angles theta, it's not even dependent on, on theta. 
So if you if you're not moving your hand up to the right for very high, um, so it's actually a um, almost constant. But that's not part of dimensional analysis. The fact is almost constant. But basically, you start out with trying to figure out the four argument function if you want to do physical experiments here, the gravity from experiments. We only need to figure out figure out the one argument function, acceleration, and um, the if you remember. The, the two pi factor here, and you're in this uh, uh, hangover state, you probably don't have a problem with computing the actual gravity of your elevator or whatever. And um, but in general, the, the, the physics behind is what well, the, the physics gain here, of course, is if you do numerical simulation or experiments, it's clearly much easier to di to figure out a one argument function ACK instead of a four argument gravity from experiments. You can set up just a few variations here for different um, angles theta, and then you can sort of determine that this is almost constant for small angles, and you can also draw it for, for other angles. Okay, summing up. Um, it's, I think, from my understanding, was useful to do dimensional analysis with dependent types. So these uh, physical quantities um, described as a graded field. It's a field graded by an abelian group of dimensions. Um, it's interesting. I'm also in parallel writing a paper of tensor calculus, and that's also a graded field. Uh, tensors have an order. It's sometimes called rank. So the, the number of uh, vectors they take in or, or spit out, and that, that's also a grading structure. And it's interesting to note that um, in physics, people actually use both dimensions and tensors quite a bit. And then you've got these interesting questions, which I haven't explored yet. It's like when you do multiple gradings here, if you've got a tensor of a certain order of a quantity of a certain dimension, or do you want the quantity of a certain dimension over tensors of a certain order? So which will, will this be equivalent? I mean, usually you would expect a vector, for example, to have uh, components of the same dimension inside, but uh, exactly how these combine, it's not, uh, not obvious. So um, yeah, those are sort of open future questions. We should write up this in the paper and submit it. We have been busy with other things so far and teaching a course and so on, but um, that was... Uh, the current state or the, the one of the course of the paper, which is reasonably easily explainable. Okay, more questions? Uh, actually, Thanks. I kind of a challenge you. I mean, I know, see if what your framework can uh, be of use. So, you know, SGSE and SGSM. Uh, I'm not sure what this abbreviation stands for. Oh, well, uh, SGS is that, I mean, basic system that centimeters, gram, uh, what else? Well, Second centimeters, oh, whatever. So and CGS. E and yeah, I see, oh, CGS, okay. And E and M are, E is electricity, M for magnetism, right? So there actually there's two different systems when it comes to electromagnetics. For in S, uh, I forget, I mean, uh, in E system, the uh, equations that uh, for electricity, they have a, I mean, a simpler form. And in M, equations for magnetism have a simpler form. So, uh, because, I mean, I know in, like, for example, if you use Coulomb uh, law in E system, then it's the constant only one, one over four pi and so forth. So it's in the dimensionless constant. There is no, I mean, like an SI epsilon, epsilon zero and so forth. It's just, I mean, I know one over four pi. So when you have a magnetism ampere law in M system, then it also constant that's very simple. I think it's four pi as well. I mean, or something like that. So in, if you stay only in magnetism, electricity, then they have a simple equation. So you stay only in magnetism, you have simple equations. But when you actually have electromagnetism, so you have, I mean, both magnetic things and there is some kind of, I mean, induction, then the, some fact, weird factors have to appear to reconcile the both systems because the systems actually, I mean, they're kind of separate. So to bring them together, you need to, I mean, introduce constants like permittivity of a vacuum and so forth and some and some different places. So you need to know where to introduce it. 
So, well, that's all. I mean, I know. I mean, I know if you study that, that I mean, the textbooks tell you, I mean, at which point you have to introduce Polak. But it would be nice if you kind of method system that tells you, okay, so you now have to introduce if you, I mean, and not try to bring the, I mean, calculations in one system and into, I mean, another system to have some, for example, induction electricity in, uh, by magnetic action, then you have to bring both things. Then you have to introduce some constant here and there at some specific places. Yeah, I'm not sure if there was a question in there. Well, the, the challenge is to, I mean, it's not a question, it's kind of a challenge. So if your system can be of help in this, I mean, reconciling E and M systems. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything fundamental here. I'm just describing the sort of type or algebraic structure of these things. I, I think what might be useful there, which I haven't really seen described, is, is a little bit related to what we talked about, multiple grading. I would assume that if you describe separately the electrum, electric system and the magnetic systems, and then you would like to combine them, then it's a little bit like uh, um, a disjoint sum of two systems, if you can keep them apart. But if they actually interact, then you have to have these conversion factors. So maybe it's useful yes, to say, what... okay, you, you're grading, let's assume there could two different dimension systems graded by D and the D prime, and then you want to grade them by a combination of D and D prime. Would you take the product of D and D prime or the sum of D and D prime? And I mean, yeah, how, how should you? Let yes, them so that's, yeah, so that's, I mean, uh, there are rules, I mean, currently in the textbook, it's kind of ad hoc. They say, okay, if you write this uh, equation, that if you, I mean, uh, combine electricity and magnetism, then you have to introduce some kind of conversion constants here and there somewhere. And then, mm. I mean, I know, well, you kind of yeah, yeah, that, that, have to introduce. That might be a useful way of, of, of describing it. It's uh, related to, I mean, uh, the tensor calculus side actually went because the, this, uh, I mean, it's, you you build up this vector space of dimensions from sort of individual copies of the of the different dimensions, and you assume that they are independent. Um, but it's exactly what independent means here is is perhaps not very well specified, and and um, it would be interesting to explore further. Uh, I, th I think this multiple grading question is very interesting, uh, uh, and in particular when one of them is tensors, I think it's straightforward though, isn't it? So a, a, a vector of velocities is a vector of time-dependent positions, and that's equivalent to a time-dependent vector of position. Mm. Uh, and that's because a vector of is uh, an Aperian functor, it's, it's, um, it's uh, index arrow. Uh, in the in the vector, um, and that's going to commute with all sorts of stuff. Mm. Yes, but, Maybe but then the you... combinations of, yeah. of 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 gradings are not going to be quite so well behaved. But uh, tensor gradings are going to commute with all sorts of things. Mm. Yeah, I expect so. So, but but one thing that we were thinking about, which might be interesting, is when you have this kind of autom automatic differentiation things. When you've got a a tuple or a list with where the first the value and then it's its speed and then acceleration and so on. Uh, if you have this kind of tuple, which which actually have different dimensions and different components, um, then you have to sort of keep track of the uh, dimensions properly when you multiply them and so on. And uh, oh, that's, that's but that's that's different. That's not yeah, that, a, that's not the tensor example. That's not, but that's that's something where where the mul yeah, where mm, the mm. sort of combining gradings might be more interesting, where they don't sort of right okay combine yes, in yes. the in the obvious way. And I'm, I'm sure there are other examples of graded fields. If I remember it co correctly, or graded rings, perhaps, I, I think that polynomials is another example. If you keep track of, of the maximum degree of polynomials, you can sort of separate out the set of all polynomials into graded uh, subsets, and then you can multiply mixes them up, but, but addition keeps uh, within. And, and so on. And maybe that's useful in combinations with dimensional analysis, who knows what, and so on. So there, there are there, there's a sort of interesting avenues for future work here. And I'm, if somebody wants to Absolutely. work in it, I'm all, all ears. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Patrick. 
Can I ask a question about uh, so the, I, it's just a syntax uh, syntax thing that I didn't get. So on your on your slide six, when you I think um, <clears throat> you had something called type one. Yep. And then lower you have type. Yes. So what do these things mean, and what's the difference? Yeah, so so in in Agda they're, they're the default called type oh, set one and set, but that I thought was a little bit confusing. So, well, type is ah, well, it's different see. universes. Okay. So so type the the reason that the record okay, so it's the same as set. Well. Yes, well, it, it, it's uh -huh. the word sets okay. is perhaps not well chosen in Agda. Uh, they actually changed it in in cubicle Agda to type, um, and it's type. So is this cubicle Agda? No, but uh, I, I just added the synonym type equals set. <laughs> so in the I, I was just a little bit because you have type in Idris, but then you don't have levels in Idris. And in fact, I thought it was set, and I didn't. I I I, I was wondering whether this is like a different yeah, so kind I, of thing altogether. Maybe I should have mentioned that, but I'm I'm actually this is Agda code, but I'm added that those two synonyms and uh, but. Uh, we're writing this paper with Nikola, and he's written his code in Idris. <laughs> and then we got this student who wanted to try out some stuff, and he's using Cubicle Agda. So we actually got, in some sense, three different code bases for the formalization of this, and that's a bit inconvenient. So I'd like to stick with one. But uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question. Have you looked at uh, how this is handled in Wolfram language and Wolfram Alpha? Because I think they also have a, a method of dealing with uh, dimensioned quantities and unit systems. I haven't checked, but my, my feeling is that Wolfram Alpha is basically untyped. So um, uh, they have they have a framework for dealing with uh, physical dimension quantities. Mm. No, I, I haven't checked it. The internal language is untyped, but uh, you can ask it uh, externally facing questions about dimensions. Mm. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add there because I haven't tried it, so um, mm. I shouldn't speculate. <clears throat> Any other question for Patrick or comments? If not, th thanks a lot for the interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, I think you can stop recording.